it has been a wonderful day so far we have had some very very good sessions by industry leaders and in line now we have the first panel discussion of the day and it's on one of the most important and talked about topics in the open source ecosystem the panel topic today open source compliance licensing trends and enforcement enforcement chairing the panel is biju k nayar who's a lawyer and founding partner of legal itech biju and his team help companies and open source projects across the globe in open source compliance and infor- enforcement is also a part of open innovation open invention network and lot network joining us also is i could fc i could fc is a computer engineer with psc degree and has held various roles ranging from technical manager to sales in the history of itext currently he is working as license compliance manager and his core responsibility is to help create global awareness regarding open source and open source licensing he collaborates with all sorts of organizations using open source products and provides insights about compliance to their license licensing also joining us is martin kalinan martin has over 20 years experience providing organizations with strategies to manage business risks associated with open source software supply chains which include ip compliance processes security vulnerability management and procurement he is actively involved in the open source software risk management industry and is founder of the open chain iso iec 5230 ratio 2020 partner south also partner source code control limited we welcome you martin next joining us is bala krishnan mukundraj an open source software specialist at robert bosch india he has been working with open source for close to 6 plus years now his major part of work has been oss compliance consultation audit and training programs he is also involved in organization level oss policy enhancement enhancement also joining us today is shri harsha narayanam Shri Harsha is senior engineering executive at Huawei Technologies India Private Limited and ho- and has over 17 years of experience and is currently leading and contributing to center of excellence team evangelizing new engineering capability in areas such as continuous delivery devops open source compliance cyber security cloud native approach privacy protection and reliability engineering he has worked his his work with team across domains storage big data database and handset to bring engineering improvements and comes with strong ability to bridge the big picture view to achievable technology components and drive its end to end implementation i request the audience to post their questions in the q and a box located on the right hand side of the windows and hand over the session to the chair mr biju nayar all over to you now thank you thank you for uh... the introduction good evening one and all i'm happy to be part of the panel and we have uh, experts from across the globe who have experience wide ranging experience ranging from uh, you know being part of an hobby project which has become the largest uh, you know open source entity in the world to companies like bosch which also has wide range of you know is within the uh, umber law of robert bosch we also have shrinara uh, shrihari shriharsham and martin so all of uh, you know them have a diverse background technical legal you know with this i think we will have a wonderful session today with this background so uh, with that i would ask uh, you know martin to give a brief background of his work Source code control and also before this uh, around open source compliance and licensing trends. Okay, hello everybody. I hope you're having a great conference, and uh, thanks for inviting me to be part of this panel. So um, we we provide a range of services primarily for any company developing technology that in, involves software. to manage their intellectual property also security related to the use of open source in software development now a lot of the companies that we work with do not consider themselves open source companies 
And be because of that, the kind of business leaders of those organizations don't believe they need to manage open source. But the, the reality, as probably most people at this conference would know, is all software developed today will consume open source components, libraries, frameworks, you know, it makes for rapid software development. But that use of open source can bring risk into an organization's technology, which is then passed on to customers. So we provide services to help address that. We provide training programs to all, all parts of the organization about what needs to be managed, how you manage it. We help companies produce policies, which include, for instance, if the organization has IP value in the software they're developing, they probably don't want to share the source code. So we create policies and guidance for developers about what to avoid coming into their code, which they're shipping to their customers. We also include, are there any known security vulnerabilities in the components the library's being used? Uh, then most companies can't actually identify what open source is being used. So we help them adopt tools, generally referred to as software composition analysis tools, which can identify licenses associated with components and vulnerabilities. But the key thing that we do related to that is actually provide some interpretation. So it's one thing having a tool that says you've got GPL components or MIT components, but if you don't understand the license implications of those, arguably, you're, 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 you're no better off. And we, we could do that as a, as a whole managed service. Now, in, in introductions, the uh, term open chain was used. So open chain is a global project which is hosted by the Linux Foundation. And many companies contribute, including us, to that. And it's basically companies have come together, all with a vested interest in open source and use of open source, to standardize how, how do you manage that kind of supply chain of software? And how, more importantly, how do you prove that to your customers that you're not passing risk on to them? And that is now an ISO standard. So you can, if you adopt these processes, you can get a badge that says, You've got processes that manage open source in software development, which gives a lot of confidence to the customers you're shipping your, your solution uh, to, or if it's hosted, you know, a, a software as a service. So that's basically, in essence, what, what, what we do. Uh, the, the, the final thing I would just say is uh, we also work the other side of the equation. A lot of, a lot of procurement organizations are concerned about incoming software and how do they vet their suppliers. So we also help. With, with with that in a similar sort of way. Thank you, Martin. That was quite uh, you know clear understanding of uh, you know the broad area of services you guys provide. Okay. And coming to I could uh, you know your company has been one of the leaders in the in the PDF space and uh, you know so you have uh, could you uh, tell us what are the services you guys provide in the, in the open source source space. Sure. Thanks, Piju. Hi, everyone. Uh, first of all, it's a great pleasure to be a part of this conference. Um, first of all, ITEX is an open source project. Uh, so we are seen as a leader in the PDF technology. And actually, we have been around more than 20 years now. So um, we have a flagship product called ITEX Core Library, which is actually known by many of the developers around the world. And this library is fully open source under a GPL v3 license. So um, we also have several add-ons, of course, around the ITX core library. And these are all bringing extra functionalities uh, to the core functionality. And these are, some of them are also open source under the same license. So we are actually known as the best documented and most feature rich, actually, uh, the, the, the software uh, in the PDF technology area. And we are a part of the um, ISO committee as well, as well as the, 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 we are board member of the PDF association. So basically those are the bodies which are uh, kind of shaping the, the future of the PDF technology. So with this, I can gladly say that, you know, uh, we are at the forefront of the PDF technology and um, our technology is used in more than 70% of the Fortune 50 uh, technologies all over the world. And uh, we keep adding new features, uh, functionalities into our product, and also introduce new, uh, new products as well uh, into our product portfolio. Thank you, Aykut. So over to you, Balakrishnam. So Balakrishnam, 
Could you just explain, you know, your involvement in the open source compliance and training and other things, what you do at Bosch? Uh, thank you, Vijay. Hello, everyone. Uh, good afternoon. Good day to everyone. Um, so I have been working with open source for close to six plus years now. And uh, what uh, before I come to what I do with open source compliance, uh, ours is a rather a big organization, right? And then uh, we have 20 plus business units under the umbrella of Robert Bosch worldwide. So when there is an open source uh, compliance policy that has been developed or uh, that has been asked to implement by different business units. That's where uh, Robert Bosch India comes in. Robert Bosch India is one of the official service provider for Robert Bosch World for open source compliance activities and any other training programs. Uh, so at the core of Robert Bosch Worldwide, we have two legal heads of open source and two technical heads of open source. Along with them, there are uh, OSPO officers in each business unit. So all of us come together. We develop open source compliance uh, trainings, policies, and uh, you know uh, any other necessary regulations that are necessary to achieve open source compliance across the organization. And uh, I have been part of Robert Bosch India for a very long time now. And uh, being part of Robert Bosch India, initially, we started with uh, providing compliance services, that is audit services to all the different business units. Later on, uh, gradually, we moved on to providing consultation services with respect to during their de design, if they come across uh, some queries about licensing or uh, some uh, license queries with respect to procured components. Uh, but then we, we provide consultations on that. And uh, gradually, we moved on to providing organization level trainings. That is, uh, we provide tool trainings, any tool we have procured or in-house developed for open source compliance activities. And then uh, we all, uh, then uh, finally, we introduced open source awareness program for the onboarding graduates within the company, because uh, uh, whether we accept it or not, Awareness program and education is the core foundation of open source compliance. Uh, when you think of uh, a, a proper open source roadmap to be uh, implemented within a company. So we took that more seriously and we uh, started giving more time towards uh, the training and uh, enhancement of the training itself. And we found this to be more useful. And uh, during one of these discussions, we also found out we need to have more universal training where OpenChain came to our rescue. And uh, OpenChain also had the same idea to create uh, transparency and uniformity across uh, the world with respect to open source compliance and education of open source. And uh, there we became part of uh, OpenChain Education Board. I was, I was announced as one of the leads for OpenChain Education Board. And uh, now we are developing OpenChain uh, compliant or, or anything open chain compliant open source awareness program, which would be available as a web-based training. We are planning to host it in Linux Foundation where everyone could take the uh, training online on Linux Foundation for free. And they would also get a certification saying they are aware of open source uh, to the bare minimum criteria. After this, we also have some dystopian ideas of uh, creating more, uh, the, uh, more FAQ kind of playbook for open source compliance flow uh, from open chain. So let's see where that goes. So this is my role overall uh, along with our organization now. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. You are educating the whole globe. <laughs> well, we try to. Yeah. Shri Harsha, you have also have technical background. You have been part of uh, OI and uh, your company also is open chain compliant and we have also business across the globe. So tell us your experience about open source compliance? Sure, sure. Actually, I, yeah, as you mentioned, uh, I come from a technical background. Um, um, I belong to a center of excellence team. We work on DevOps uh, tooling and solutions and cybersecurity. Uh, so we support different business lines. During this course, we also understood that Huawei right now in India, we have a lot of open source projects which are emerging in a global scale like Soda, uh, Harmony OS, uh, and Edge Platform, Edge Gallery, and Open Lookon. These are some of the projects which have a global reach and then they're growing. And uh, uh, Huawei India also has a huge contribution in that space. So uh, considering that, open source compliance has uh, come out as one of the important aspects where we have to focus and then you know, uh, 
um, ensure that there are no complaints, uh, uh, challenges or issues. So in this, if you see not just the open source projects, uh, the way how uh, we generally look at is the three scenarios. Uh, the scenario one is open source, which we create and host it. That's that's where the highest responsibility and uh, you know we are obligated to meet a lot of aspects. And the scenario two is somewhere where we contribute to third party open source. So that is something. So probably a lot of responsibility is a shared responsibility there. Yeah, the scenario three is we are using an open source. Pretty much all the projects do that, right? So the challenges of compliance can go um, uh, across all these scenarios. So when we look at in a holistic aspect and see what aspects have to be taken care of for each of the scenario. So that is what, uh, I mean, uh, as a center of excellence team, uh, we actually also work with our headquarters and then um, also drive the specific guidelines and then, um, uh, uh, you know, checklist kind of thing to help the team to build awareness. As Balkrishna also rightly mentioned, I also believe that. So awareness is the key. So nobody wants to usually do anything wrong, actually. It's probably because they don't know. So the key responsibility lies in creating that awareness to all the members, new members who are joining us for the open source project. So that is where uh, currently uh, I stand. So uh, I also try to marry the, uh, you know, the tooling with the compliance aspect, like how a lot of things can be taken care of by the tools and then uh, make the life of uh, the people who are working in the open source easier, actually, like that. <laughs> life made easier there, huh? yeah. And both of you uh, are com coming from companies, you know, which have uh, you know, uh, made open chain, uh, you know, compliant. And, uh, you know, you all, both of you have, uh, you know, various vendors and across the globe. So I think uh, open chain uh, also is like one of the best platform today and with an ISO standard now. For you to come, make sure ensure compliance at all uh, you know levels of you know across countries, across vendors, across the whole supply chain. So uh, you know some of the misunderstandings which people have commonly. You know you would have all of you would have come across you know some misunderstanding when usage of open source. So could each of you you know throw some light on those misunderstandings? I could you could start with some of the misunderstandings in your experience. Yeah, sure. Yeah, indeed, that's a good uh, starting point because the misunderstanding, first of all, comes from the, I think, the, from the word itself, free, you know. So what does it mean, actually? So um, in case of open source, free actually means that, you know, you are free to use it, you are free to do whatever you do, you want to do it with the, within your project and so on. But it doesn't mean that you are free of obligations, okay? So... Um, these these requirements actually these obligations are written in the open source license document in the end, and this license document is always attached to the, the software that you are using, open source software that you are using. Of course, the, the issue here actually is that you know there are hundreds of different open source software license types. You know, some of them are permissive, some of them are non-permissive. So from a from a kind of a developer's perspective, you know, it's quite difficult to you know know which one to do what, you know, nowadays there are you know, automation tools for that. Luckily, you know, that can give you, give you a really good insight about them. But uh, since we are a widely accepted, you know, uh, since PDF is a widely accepted document standard, you know, in, in the world, and uh, we have a library, which is basically to do everything about PDF, our library is used by, you know, many organizations as well. So it can be a small, mid-range company, but as well as really a large enterprise companies as well. So we get, I mean, from all sorts of companies or organizations and users, we frequently get that question to our email inbox. So we have a, at ITEX, we have a, a special uh, e email inbox for that so that we can receive such questions uh, from our users. And we receive these questions a lot. So you're saying that, you know, um, uh, you know, it says it is free, but is it really free? There is also a misunderstanding that, you know, um, uh, there is, it is open source, it is free, but, um, uh, you know, there, is a, there are different business models that, you know, you make it open source, but certain part of it, you make it open source. But if you need certain functionalities, then you go to a commercial uh, version of it. So people always kind of confuse these two as well, that, you know, um, open source is always free and there's anything related to commercial part of it, 
then there is something, there is another software type. But that's not the case, actually. In our case, in ITEX, we have one open source software which is used actually across, basically. So you can have commercial license or uh, you can use it under the, uh, the open source license as well. And I could, uh, you know, does your, your company provide training for this clearing these misunderstandings, you know, some sort of training or webinars and stuff? Uh, we do. So um, there's actually uh, quite an ongoing exercise from us, especially recently. Uh, like, for example, we joined this conference uh, for that reason as well. Um, so to, to create awareness, basically. We had also a webinar uh, where we actually touch upon, you know, on the, on the compliance and as well as the, you know, the different license types and basically specifically to ITEX as well. And for, from our experience, what we see as a problem so we are happy to, of course, you know, uh, join more conferences. You know, people here, you know, people who are hearing us via this conference, you know, can invite us to these uh, events, conferences, even to the schools, for example, because, you know, it, it starts from there. I'm also a computer engineer myself, but, you know, when I remember my education time, it was a, there was a little, you know, explanation regarding the open source license types. And um, that would be actually cool if you, if, if you get such requests from the community as well. And we are doing our best to educate the, the, the community. Yeah, that's wonderful. So I think, uh, you know, I think we should give a shout out to Open Chain because they have done a wonderful job uh, creating awareness, providing resource materials at, at a global level and, you know, having common standards. I think that, that goes for a big credit to the Open Chain uh, project. Uh, although we don't have Shane today in this session, but I think the good work of his, we can all talk about and the ISO standard it is maintaining. So with that, Martin, uh, you know, what are the various misunderstanding, you know, you have come across, you have been, uh, you know, working on this for the last 20 years and you also have a different background and, you know, experiences across the globe. Even in India, you have a team which helps companies and startups to comply. And you're also, also taking care of the open chain uh, compliance and you're also part of the open chain ISO standards. Yeah, so, certainly. I I think I can't, I, yeah, I, I can't raise some you know, very valid points. I mean, the term open source is broadly misunderstood and it, there's not one definition because there are thousands, literally thousands of different licenses, variants of the same license, yeah, GPL 1, 2, 3, AGPL, uh, MIT, Apache. So you just can't say, I've got open source. You could have a variety of open source, all with different obligations. And you know, another thing that was mentioned was tooling. There, is, there are tools that will identify all the open source in your code. But unless you can, they generally don't provide interpretation uh, about, so you've got a GPL license, what does that mean to you? What's the obligation? And then how do you address that obligation? And because that's so confusing, generally people just don't do anything. And a, a big part of what we do, we look at business risk as opposed to working you know, just with developers. You know, developers shouldn't have to wait, be spending time interpreting licenses, they should be developing and being creative and building a solution. So you need to put this guidance in place. So a, a key part of what we do, and it's fundamental to what we do is ed education. So if we start working with a company, we start with an education program and get a, a level of understanding across the business about the different types of licenses, what the implications, and then that helps you understand what you need to, to, to manage, what tools you need to put in place, and then what, 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 what decisions you make. Now, if, if you went back three, four years, say just around the time of the start of the Open Chain project, most people would look at it from a business risk perspective and say, it's a low risk, I'll just ignore it. You know, it's freely available, I could get the code off GitHub and it's great, we could build our solutions. The world's changed, you know, um, it's taken far more seriously. There's been some high-profile uh, uh, 
open source enforcement. And quite often that enforcement is not done by lawyers, it's done by pressure from the community or people in general. So uh, as, as an example, Tesla, who everybody will be probably know, are leaders in the electric vehicle market. And the reason why they're leaders is their software. Uh, you know, software first, um, you know, uh, solution. They were they were forced to share the source code of their navigation system, and it it was two years of pressure in in the in the press, and eventually they released the source code of their navigation system. Clearly, it took two years. They did not want to release the source code of the navigation system. So now all the other car manufacturers can see how they do navigation and and you use use that in their development. Um, so, so one of the services we do is we work with investors and companies buying other companies to evaluate, is there any risk in the code? So if we invest in this company, is there a risk that uh, they're going to have to share the source code and then the value of the IP goes to nothing? Not one company is, uh, that we've uh, reviewed their code have known what's in their code and the implications of that. And I'll include security in that. If you invest in a company and they have a massive security breach, that's going to cost a lot of money to resolve. And arguably, a lot of your investments will go, go, go on to that. Um, you know, we, we, we've, we've, we've found iText in uh, your company's code that investors are looking at. They haven't got a commercial license. They're not sharing their source code. As, which is an obligation of, say, the AGPL license that iText is under. So they're, they're not conformance with the license. That's a risk. So in, investors, are, you know, they're, they're not interested in the detail. Say, so is it a risky investment? Yes or no? And I look at it and say, that's a risky investment. And our work typically, there is a delay in the investments. There's a change in the amount of investments by what we find in people's code. And actually, um, Open Chain. If you look on the Open Chain website, it's got some. How can you use Open Chain in mergers and acquisitions? Um, so you can benchmark a target company, their uh, maturity of managing all this, and then you can say it's a risky investment or it's not a risky investment. If it made sense. Thank you, Martin. So yeah. adding to that, you know what I recently had an opportunity to look into are the people who are enforcing the open source licenses so traditionally it was you know the communities free software foundation or uh, you know software freedom law center then i saw even competitors enforcing it people uh, individual uh, uh, you know owners also developers also enforcing it copyright trolls enforcing it enforcement through customs uh, agencies also people are doing competitors and en enforcing it there was a Good case of co kinetics versus Panasonic, where the claim for damages was 100 million US dollars, and uh, Panasonic was forced to comply. Like we gave the example of Tesla. In that case, also the competitors forced Panasonic to comply. So, so the risk is high, and as you rightly said, the, the security risk. We have seen yeah. the Irwin case and other cases where uh, you know. Uh, Companies which have been negligent in complying, and uh, uh, you know, I think Sri Harsha, you and uh, Bala, Balakrishna, you also can, uh, you know, tell us, you know, more about your experiences, how you have been, uh, you know, trying to help in not only educating uh, the, the community at large, also, you know, doing compliance and enforcing it internally and externally also. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I was just waiting. I was uh, thinking that yes, I would take the call. Yeah, uh, that's a good question, Biju. So, you, you know, it becomes very difficult when you have to uh, explain the uh, these kind of uh, license ambiguity to your development team, whether it being internal or external. Uh, it even it's even a tedious task to figure out whether your vendors also complied with these license ambiguities. Um, so I would try to keep it more generic here, yep. uh, not only wash but in a, a general circle. Uh, the licenses get so ambiguous, and you don't know whether you're complying with it or not. I can give you one small example here. Uh, 
there are certain licenses which do not allow you to use within a commercial organization itself not for commercial purpose but for a com- but within a commercial organization itself but then the developers think okay uh, anyway i can uh, and the same like a same component would be available in commercial space as well what the developers would think is it's okay if i use it for my proof of concept or proof of experiment uh, within the company if it takes off then i'll purchase a commercial license no you're not allowed to do that because the license clearly says that you can you can use it if you want to use the free version you either have to be a education society or a non profit organization otherwise you cannot use it not even for uh, proof of concept or proof of experiment so explaining these things to any user uh, might be within my company or outside it becomes quite a tedious task at this point of time while providing education about what compliance is and how they have to look into the licenses one key thing what we have to educate them is always keep in touch with your lawyers so that you don't make a cho- you don't make your own choice of licenses so that's one way how we try to handle compliance along with additional awareness education where the, it's also an education where you tell people not to make your own legal choices because there are dedicated people who can do that and there are more intricacies involved in it while you make decisions on legal aspects so, uh, i hope that made us uh, thank you bala so shri harsha i want you to uh, you know it's also a common misnomer or, or a misunderstanding that the open source team will take care of open source compliance the sales team doesn't want to uh, should not uh, should not be involved the legal team and the uh, you know open source team is the only two 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 departments which should be involved uh, and all this misunderstanding so could you elaborate more on this you know who and all should be involved in open source compliance right okay um, uh, so coming to that point i'll just elaborate a little bit more actually so for example if uh, taken a case where we are actually contributing to a external open source and then we are working together collaborating okay so there is also sometimes a misnomer that maybe the the open source whoever is hosting the open source they will take care of the compliance so uh, that is also one uh, common problem right so uh, so if we have to take care to what level we have to take care so these are all some questions so as balakrishna also rightly mentioned actually first is definitely at the beginning when we are trying to contribute or when we are trying to host coming to a, sta- a common understanding on what copyright statement we want to use what licensing we want to use all this i think legal team advice is a must so that is one section of it second from a quality angle what kind of a tooling we have to use uh, uh, to ensure uh, that day to day when a code is checked in what checks and balances we have to keep and third from a cyber security angle so what level of cyber security we want to ensure so beyond that i also want to touch upon quality perspective okay so there is also a common misnomer that uh, if a product is delivered uh, from an organization uh, so that needs to have a very high quality probably open source code can go with respect to community if they are not checking so much actually i mean i'm just saying not all communities will have a you know strong pipelines and uh, you know uh, check gates so that doesn't mean probably it is not necessary to meet that standards okay so always i think uh, one important aspect is to set uh, standards very high even for the open source project same to the delivery project with respect to the quality with respect to the cyber security with respect to tooling and the first aspect is to decide uh, what license copyrights everybody has to follow i think that sets a right tone for any of the open source project uh, to go in a right direction from a compliance standpoint that's what my feeling is yeah and i think uh, you know we should give a shout out to all those great projects like xpdx which is an iso standard which can be used by entities uh, you know and uh, so which is an open source tool and a pro- open source project which can be used for compliance and uh, you know whether it is detection of libraries snippets ev- licensing obligations all those can be uh, martin you want to uh, elaborate more on that Yeah so I just like to also extend on the last answer about open source projects um this kind of big mixed views so some people say if it's commercial software that it's better managed therefore it's less risk and open and there's a, a view of open source that there's a big community that's going to fix everything and it's it's somewhere in the middle you, you uh 
you know, we talked about maturity of uh, some projects. You know, some projects are managed by one person. Yeah. Um, you, you can look at one of the ways of looking at the quality of open source is to look at the activity around the component or the library or the or the package that you're looking to bring into your software. So um, there are tools that can bring in all this data about the number of commits because a, a, a hidden risk for companies is they bring in open source components and there's, there's no nobody managing that project anymore. So it's, in effect, it's a dead project, but, but it works. So it addresses a technical challenge and you ship this product to a customer, which includes that software. And then there's an issue with it. Nobody's going to fix the issue. You're probably going to have to fix it yourself, find a replacement. So as regards to quality of software, there should be also some checks and balances about you know, how, how well supported that is. And then, so to answer your question about these other projects, so if you if you look at code on, say, GitHub or Node or whatever, uh, and you look at the license information, it's never consistent. Yeah. You know, some people put a copyright statement, some people put Apache V2 or Apache 2.0, and that makes it hard to manage all those different licenses coming into your code. So a sister project, if you like, of OpenChain is SPDX, Software Packet Data Exchange. And that, that is now an ISO standard as well. And the idea of SPDX is to drive consistency of documentation of licenses, both, to, both in human-readable format and uh, uh, computer, computer read, machine-readable. So that um, when you consume software, you can easily identify what licenses are in the code. And when you ship your software, you can easily communicate what licenses are in your code, which makes it easier for everybody to manage because today it's not easy to manage. Is what I'm saying. Thank you, Martin. So I could, uh, you know, you will find uh, various, you would have found various compliance issues, uh, you know, in your experience. So what are the steps you would suggest so that this compliance issues or, uh, you know, open source, you know, issues are uh, taken care internally and, uh, you know, by external companies also. What is your advice? Uh, before uh, giving some thought about that, uh, you know, I want to touch upon the, the previous conversation as well, that, you know, um, nowadays, you know, there are a lot of open source software around there, you know, managed by one person, com uh, one person, basically people uh, around the world, but, uh, there's also a terminology called, you know, commercial source. You know, that means that, you know, um, uh, certain open source projects are actually uh, made open source, but there's also a commerciality behind this. So commerciality is not just to get some revenue from the companies who want to use the software, but also they bring, you know, all the extra things like, for example, the support, which is very important, actually, for enterprises, especially. Also warranty, like indemnification as well. And then as well as the, the, the right to use the software outside of the scope of the open source license, basically. Yeah, kind of a, you use, you comply with the, the, the open source license, or if you cannot do it, you can take the commercial license. But that choosing that commercial license is not only for using that software, but also, you know, it brings a lot of extra functionalities as well. Um, but for, the, for, the, for your question, actually, is that, you know, we need to look at the reasons actually behind why uh, these things actually happen. Uh, so for me, actually, like there, there are several things here. Like the first one, for example, is that um, people also always think that, you know, if they use one version of a software, you know, X library in their project, and that comes along with, for example, the Apache license, you know, and if they, for example, later on upgrade their system to the newer versions, they think that, okay, yeah, I complied with this already, you know, Apache license before, so I don't need to check that anymore, you know? But this compliance check actually is a kind of um, ongoing check. It's a continuous check in here because it happened to us as well in ITEX, for example, just to give you an example from ITEX. So we have, we have three major releases in the past. So ITEX 2, which is the earliest release. And then we have ITEX 5 and ITEX 7, which is the latest version of ITEX library. And uh, with ITEX 5, we changed our licensing model to AGPL v3 license. So suppose that now people were using ITEX 2 version 2 earlier, you know, they become in a kind of a non-compliant situation when they move their uh, software 
or they upgrade their software to ITX5, for example. So that's actually one, the first, but this is quite, quite common actually as well. And we get this question also a lot. So um, the second thing actually is that, you know, uh, I think Balakrishna also mentioned that it's just like, it's just by overlook, basically. So people just thought that this is just a, you know, a, a open source free, you know, I can use it in, a, in, in any way and just, just overlooked in the end. So um, obviously we have been talking about, you know, uh, there needs to be a lawyer that we need to ask always is, but it's all, not always possible with organizations, right? I mean, I mean, we have been, maybe we are all from, and if, you know, uh, like Bosch and so on, these are all good enterprises, you know, you can have a little, like an army of lawyers in the end, but it's not always possible for smaller companies, you know? So, um, but these are actually um, very simple checks, to be honest, uh, to do. And uh, if you, if you, you know, avoid or if you kind of overlook these checks, basically you are, you are, you are risking your business, uh, you know, for you. So um, the, the thing also is that, you know, um, I want to touch upon this part as well as that, you know, we see this quite often in the large enterprises that, you know, for example, X bank or enterprise, whatever, you know, most of them today, they don't implement their software themselves. You know, they do some, but most part, they also use um, external software providers. And what I actually realized actually, or what I experienced actually is that people, even in such enterprises, they just don't know what is in the software that they actually received from a third party software vendor. So today we have something called, you know, software bill of material. So whenever, it doesn't matter if it's enterprise or a small company, whenever they receive a software from a third party vendor, they need to, or this is their responsibility to check the software bill of material. You know, what is, what is it shipped, you know, uh, inside? So in the end, as, as a user of that software, they are responsible for that. You know, if they are using, if they are becoming non-compliant, then they are non-compliant as a user of that a software. So, um, you know, also maybe a small thing, just my, you know, my, my thinking, we can also discuss it maybe here as well, that, you know, to me, since I am coming from a technical domain as well, uh, that, you know, most of the time, I think the developers think that this is, um, the, 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 the license document is something too legal document. It, it, most of the time you don't understand it at all. And you just put it aside for, for a moment and you just do your proof of concept and so on, okay? So when it comes to your production, then you realize, oh, okay, I mean, there needs to be checked, you know? Then your legal team or whatever checks and then you realize that, oh, okay, all this effort actually is gone for nothing. So on the other hand, it is also possible that like, for example, lawyers, you know, um, they read the document, the license document, but they find it's too technical in the end, you know? because there's a lot of technical touch on this as well. So there needs to be a kind of synergy in between technical team and also in the legal team, because this overlook actually, I think it comes from this middle part that, you know, um, you know uh, people don't take that responsibility. You know, it's, I don't understand this. And then, you know, uh, it comes in, the be in between the two worlds in the end. Yeah. Thanks, Arikud. That was really interesting. Uh, Balakrishna, you have, uh, you know, you have developers, you have, you interact with the legal team. So, so you have, uh, you know, a multi-modal, uh, you know, multi-departmental interaction. So, uh, you know, and you also have a technical background. So, so what are the challenges you have seen, uh, you know, when you're educating or the, some of the queries which come to you? So, you know, I could also mention about the requirement of software bill of material and stuff. So, and you also train, uh, you know, employees from all levels, like people who have just entered uh, Bosch or they are just freshers at, to the highest level of, uh, you know, employees. So what is your experience and what are the best practices you think of which should be done? Yeah. Uh, is open source compliance, one step process, or it's a continuous process because that's also a misnomer. People think that, okay, I've done it compliance. Like I could uh, recently said that, you know, uh, one version I've complied, oh, I have complied with all versions. So all those, uh, you know, could you just throw some light on that? Yes, uh, that's a very good question, Biju. Uh, while answering this question, I would also like to touch upon the points which uh, Martin and Ayut uh, mentioned, I could mention that, see, uh, one thing, 
not only bosh anywhere when we are trading or even uh, imparting any sort of knowledge to any developer uh, or any executive level member about open source first thing we tell them uh, not only me uh, actually this was uh, initially quoted by my superior uh, technical head of open source at bosh he used to say the first original open source licenses were written by the technical people and not lawyers yes. so all the first original uh, open source licenses they were uh, developed by tech, uh, engineers like us or technical heads like us and uh, lawyers came in when it had to be enhanced for further protection or further uh, you know adherence towards open source policies globally right so what we tell all the developers and all the uh, executives at first is put your technical hat on read the license first read it with a technical perspective if you feel it does not satisfy your project then go to a lawyer but if you feel it satisfies your project well okay the first step is clear um, and if it very clearly says you're not going to do anything that is against your company policies take it uh, if you're building your software if you don't have a lawyer fair enough you build your software but finally when you are pushing it through one of the scanning tools you don't have to go for a commercial uh, scanning tool itself there are a lot of open source scanning tools which can scan uh, scan and give a list of all the copyrights components and licenses finally when you have that list approaching a lawyer wouldn't be much difficult so i agree a uh, company like bosch or huawei or uh, itext any other company we have huge number of lawyers you can go and talk to them and then you can get your uh, uh, necessary legal support but for smaller companies of course uh, there are a lot of incubation companies who also go through uh, these phases where they say okay i do not have the resources uh, for open source compliance and uh, how do i do this 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 questions come up during the training and uh, we say don't worry if your te- technical head says that it's fine to be used as per my knowledge then go ahead build your software and then wa- before you deliver you do the uh, scan done once you have the scan done you will have list of all the licenses copyrights and everything just ensure that everything that you have used at least by the developer perspective or the uh, technical involved person perspective you will know that every component that you have borrowed and used from open source world is listed there so once you ensure that uh, checklist you go back you go to your lawyer and in one shot you can you get to see which licenses uh, can help you achieve the compliances and which do not and if there are any possible workarounds then those can be sought after right so that is one point which we would mention and uh, coming back to the original question if it is a one time activity definitely not uh it's not a one time activity because one as i could said with each version upgrade there might be possible with a major version upgrade there's a uh, there's a possibility of license change which has to be kept a look which has to be kept in uh, in the tab right other than that the key uh, aspect which we also have to look into is what martin said even though you are using a old a old version of a software some new vulnerability might be found on later days someone else in the open source world might have put their efforts towards finding out some effort because all the vulnerabilities cannot be found while you develop or in, in the initial days of the release of a version of a component itself some of the vulnerabilities or some of the security risks they pop up over use and these things also you need to keep a check of and uh, there are various ways you can do it manually depending on your product line or you can do it automatically there are various tools that provide you that so you have to constantly keep a check of all the open source components you have done uh, you have used in your product and whenever a, a security vulnerability or a security risk occurs you have to immediately fix that and send it out so there's a constant check of license and security risks that have to be seen either by version upgrade or by long term use thank you balakrishna so thank you vijay shri harsha shri harsha you could you elaborate you know from a startup perspective or you know smaller companies perspective what are the tools which they could use uh, you know and uh, you know yeah, as i could say you know the dependency on lawyers can be reduced by the developers on the team so what are the tools you could and even for open source projects because we can also think of open source projects who don't don't have the resources and uh, you know so what would you be your suggestion for some of the tools and uh, could you elaborate on more on that yeah uh, i think the most important tool i would suggest is a fossology 
so that would be the um, starting point where we can understand our licensing copyrights and um, uh, whether the compatibility is there and or not. Then uh, second is a binary scan. I'm not uh, exactly recalling the, um, the tool in the open source world because we have customized that. So the binary scan tool uh, wherein we try to find out all the um, binaries, do they have the corresponding source code or there are some or often uh, binaries which also can cause sufficient risk. So that is one thing. And then uh, in a cybersecurity space, there are a lot of uh, open source tools, uh, like uh, maybe from a fuzzing angle or uh, like a peach, peach fuzzer or um, uh, from a scan burp, burp suit. All these open source tools can be used from a cybersecurity. From a quality, again, uh, we have uh, open source tools for the check style, find bugs kind of things, which can be used to ensure the quality. So, so these are some of the suit of open source tools which I can think of uh, right now. So even Sonar, Sonar Cube. So uh, if if some project is in a um, hosted in GitHub uh, right now, I think most of the um, through GitHub actions uh, we can uh, incorporate a lot of tools. Provided if our project is completely open source, they are actually free. So that is also one uh, important thing to be noted. Actually, yeah. Yeah, and even there are lightweight tools also, and even open chain. You know, uh, there is a lot of self assessment which. Uh, the startups and projects can take up and uh, you know comply with. Uh, so uh, the, the, that's the beauty of open chain project. Uh, you know, there are resources, there are discussions about tools, there are discussions about uh, you know uh, you know various aspects individually throughout the uh, month, and uh, you know projects come and explain like what is the benefit of the CII batch for an open source project. What are the various other, uh, you know, XPDX uh, tools, uh, you know, for Shology. So there is an explanation uh, in the open chain uh, project uh, every week or in, in at least every month there is a discussion and we have the benefit of Balakrishna and Martin and, uh, you know, come other global companies also, representatives from other global companies also come there and talk about, uh, you know, how they do the tooling. Uh, so there is a separate uh, tooling exercise which is done. So there is a lot of education there, which you know many of the companies could use or projects, open source projects can use and benefit from. And I think uh, that leaves us with a few minutes before we close. Uh, I would request in case there is uh, anything more more you guys to want to add. Otherwise, we can ask take some audience questions. I think one any, any parting remarks, uh, you know, takeaways from uh, Martin, you, I could. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, just so we have covered, you know, the audience might be thinking, well, so, so what, you know, is it a problem? What, what's happening is um, increasing this regulation uh, across the world, forcing tech companies to do the things we've talked about. So the software bill of materials, which you can think about as the ingredients list of the makeup of the software. The, uh, the, the US White House issued what's called an executive order about improving the nation's cybersecurity because they've had some serious hacks to their infrastructure. And in that executive order, it said any software supplied to the US should include a software bill of materials, should identify the open source components, are they vulnerable and things like that. And that's had a knock on effect. What, what we're seeing is now companies buying technology solutions are asking for a bit of materials. So there's a commercial reality to this. You know, a lot of um, Indian technology <clears throat> and software developments is exported. Yes. So you, you, you'll get to a point where you will not be able to sell your solutions to Europe, to US, unless you adopt the things we've talked about. So it's shifting from we should manage this to we have to manage it is my part in shot. Yeah, I could. Over to you. Yeah, so um, the license compliance actually, you know, um, uh, can be simply overlooked. You know, we as said before, you know, or it's a kind of a must that you have to do uh, within your organization, or you realize this uh, during M and A and so on. So this can come at a at a certain point. But we as I text, you know, um, we also receive. Um, Emails, for example, uh, kind of asking for verification 
uh, for their systems, you know, or applications if they are compliant or not. So, um, you know, if, if, if somebody who is, uh, or if any organization is encountering such issues, you know, just, they should just, you know, approach and uh, talk to the, you know, basically the copyright of the owner of the software and just, you know, um, uh, resolve the matter in the end, you know, uh, in the end, you know, we as Actics, for example, uh, we are looking for a kind of long-term relationship with our users, basically, and that can only happen, you know, uh, by collaboration. So collaboration is the, the point yes. we're having upon. Thank you, Aiku. Parakrishna, what is your takeaway for the, uh, the ecosystem? Yeah, uh, so here, uh, rather than a takeaway, I would like to suggest that you already mentioned the Open Chain has a lot of uh, reference material and training material that is available in Open Chain, as well as you do have a lot of uh, free and open source uh, education material on open source education in Todo Group or Linux Foundation. What I would say is participate in all the Open Chain education or uh, any tooling meetings and try to contribute as much as possible because there's a lot of takeaway. Uh, to each of your company and as an individual uh, where you're interested about uh, open source uh, compliance. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, sure. Over to you. Yeah, so uh, the parting uh, point, what I would want to mention is, uh, so the compliance should not be looked at uh, something different uh, from a standard quality or cyber security, what we ensure for a commercial products. It has to be imbibed into uh, standard routine checks and then that awareness has to be built. And yeah, of course, open chain uh, kind of a platform would be the best place to get that kind of a materials and customize for each of the organization and uh, you know uh, help the developers to uh, uh, comply with each of the aspects. So my, my, my parting remark is that if you don't comply, if you don't check the code or the libraries or the snippets you're using, you have to write a check. <laughs> So that would be my parting remark. So it's better uh, as the fundamental DNA of the entity, whether you are a project, you are a company, you are a startup, poor, you might be your one with the government. I remember uh, the Israeli government being forced to comply with open source. So, so whether whoever you are, just ensure compliance. Life is made easy for you. And, uh, you know, otherwise, there will be loss of reputation. There will be loss of, uh, you know, there will be security issues. Financial so losses. It's bad financial losses. That's why I said, you know, you have to write a check. check. Yeah. If you don't check it at the right time, you have to sign a check. Right. It will be a loss of reputation. So it's better comply it as early as possible and uh, take benefit of, uh, you know, organizations like Open Chain, Linux Foundation, XPDX. They are all international standards. Oh. Uh, and comply there and uh, self-certification is also possible there so so there is value and resources for everybody now i will not take more time i think we have only three minutes for the audience to ask questions unless the organizers give us more time thank you thank you Biju. that was a wonderful wonderful session i think uh, we would only be taking one question and if you can all answer that question that would be more than wonderful. So the question is, it is still very hard or a tough nut to crack when it comes to finding corporate lawyers who know open source licenses. How can one find one? What's the best way? One is sitting in front of you. <laughs> <laughs> On a lighter note. Yeah. Uh, so what I would say is uh, another way to find them is go to your to-do group or uh, open chain, you find the list of uh, participants there in one of the meeting, you will get to know who's a lawyer by the way they speak. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, so uh, the, the, the fundamental thing which I would, uh, you know, uh, because sometimes lawyers are costly, but you know, what I would suggest is, uh, uh, lot of material and lot of contribution is done by lawyers across the globe uh, uh, being part of open chain and there are a lot of materials there and uh, there are tools there so the chances of you requiring a lawyer itself is minimized by entities like open chain to do group and uh, even some of the open source projects also provide a lot of information so many of your uh, effect are uh, the questions you would have normally is answered in many of these projects. 
So to a large extent, this is taken care of there itself. But in case you want uh, to know more and you know you want to be doubly sure about things, yes, before you ship uh, your products or services, you should take a check. And uh, as, I, as I said, uh, otherwise you could have a customs enforcement, you could have a competitor enforcing against you or uh, individual patent uh, open source, uh, you know, guys uh, enforcing against you. So it is better to, you know, check before you ship products and services. Perfect. Thanks a lot, Biju. Thanks a lot, Martin. Uh, I could, Balakrishnan and Sri Harsha.